Whether you're working with calculus or not, magnetic flux is going to be at the heart of the next two modules, so you want to make sure you've got it down pat. For the calculus students, we've already gone over how to deal with electric flux in our Gauss's Law module. So how exactly does magnetic flux differ from electric flux? Easy, just every time we have the electric field passing through some area, replace it with the magnetic field. Now we're calculating the magnetic flux through some area. It really is just as simple as that. If we have some area, and a uniform magnetic field penetrates that area, we can call the area vector a vector that's perpendicular to the area, and has a magnitude equal to, well, the area itself. Then the magnetic flux through this area, phi, is defined as B dot A, or the magnetic field vector, dotted with the area vector. If we happen to know the angle theta between the B and A vectors, we can just say the magnetic flux phi is the magnitude of the magnetic field times the area times the cosine of theta. That means the magnetic flux is actually a scalar quantity. It's just a number in exactly the same way that electric flux is a scalar. At this stage, there's not really much more we need to do with this, but again, I want to stress that you should understand this magnetic flux idea backwards and forwards, because it's going to be very important in the next module and the one after that. And if you're not dealing with calculus, you can safely skip the rest of this video. You might remember from the Gauss's Law module that we can have a varying electric field, in which case the simple rule, E dot A, for flux, won't suffice. The problem is, what do we choose for E in our formula? We run into the same problem with a varying magnetic field. Depending on where we are on our sheet, we might have a stronger or weaker B field, so we have no idea what to plug in for B in our B dot A formula from before. The only solution is to turn this into an integral now. As long as we can define an infinitesimally small area element dA, the magnetic field will be uniform on that teeny tiny area element, if it's small enough. So the flux d phi through that tiny area element is just b dot dA. Then adding up or integrating the flux b dot dA for every possible infinitesimal area element across the whole area, that's enough to determine the magnetic flux through the whole area. A neat example of this would be if you had a long straight current carrying wire right next to, say, a rectangular loop, and you want to know the magnetic flux through the loop. We can figure out the direction of the magnetic field produced by the wire by using the modified right-hand rule, and we remember that the field forms concentric circles around the wire. You can't just simply use B dot A for the flux through the loop, because B changes depending on where in the loop you are. We have no choice but to make use of the general definition for magnetic flux, which involves integrating a varying magnetic field across the surface of the loop. Thankfully, since B is always perpendicular to the plane of the loop here, B and DA are always in the same direction, so their dot product is always just their magnitudes multiplied together. Also conveniently enough, instead of needing DA to be infinitesimal in both dimensions, we can call DA a single vertical slice of the loop instead, only infinitesimal in the width direction, since the magnetic field vector B has the same magnitude along the entire length of the slice, so we're not cheating here. This saves us from needing to compute a double integral, dA is just the length of the vertical slice L times dx if x is in the horizontal direction here, so we just end up with a single integral along the x dimension. Of course, if the magnitude of the magnetic field is mu naught i over 2 pi r, we can replace r with x if we measure x from the long wire as our starting point. Plugging everything in, we have the magnetic flux through the loop as the integral of mu naught i over 2 pi x, in other words, the magnitude of b times the length L times dx. A lot of the constant stuff can come out, like mu naught i over 2 pi and L. Our integral is just dx over x. Have you seen this one before? Before we get too ahead of ourselves, we need to define some bounds. So our bounds go from b, which we'll call the distance from the wire to the inner side of the loop, all the way to b plus w which is just the distance to the outer side of the loop if w is the width of the loop. The integral of dx over x is just the natural logarithm of x, and simply evaluating that logarithm at our bounds gets us the answer. Remember that the difference of two logarithms is the logarithm of their inputs divided by one another. We have mu naught i l over 2 pi, all times the natural log of b plus w, 
all over B. This is the total magnetic flux that passes through this loop. Now we've gone through how we translate electric flux to magnetic flux in the uniform case as well as in the non-uniform case. There was this thing we went over called Gauss's law in the electric field case, and a natural question might be, can we define anything similar with magnetic field? Is there like a Gauss's law equivalent for magnetism? We remember Gauss's law just stated that if we know the surface integral of E dot dA through any closed surface, it's equal to the charge that the surface encloses divided by epsilon naught. So what might the closed surface integral of B dot dA be? We have the electric flux as Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Maybe this one is something like the current enclosed over mu naught, something like that. Let's think back to our nifty current loop. If we want the magnetic field lines due to this current loop, they look something like this. If we're confused about which way the field goes, we can actually cheat a little and use our modified right-hand rule to come up with the magnetic field direction close to the wire. Just point our right thumb in the direction of the current, and our fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. Then it's easier to fill in the rest of the details. This actually allows us to introduce a rule that we're going to make use of a lot in the next two modules. The rule is, close to a current carrying wire, the magnetic field direction is given by the modified right-hand rule. If we have some set of current carrying wires all making crazy shapes and going in all sorts of directions, it can be hard to intuitively understand the direction of the magnetic field at any point in space. But close to each wire, we can use the modified right-hand rule and get a very good approximate magnetic field direction near the wire, provided the currents on all the wires are within a few orders of magnitude of one another, which is usually the case. So that helps us figure out the direction of the magnetic field lines near a current loop, and we can then use that to gauge the magnetic field direction away from the loop. So what if we imagine a spherical surface around the current loop like this? What can we say about the magnetic flux through the surface? It turns out every single magnetic field line going into the surface comes out of the surface at some point too. So the net magnetic flux through this closed surface here is zero. Isn't that strange? Even though we have a full-on current loop inside the surface, the total magnetic flux through the surface is zero. What if we only cover some of the current loop with our surface? Does that help? Turns out it actually doesn't change anything. We still have no net magnetic flux. For every field line that enters the surface, it leaves somewhere else. And every field line that leaves the surface enters at some point. So there's still no net magnetic flux through the surface. Even if we reject the current loop completely, we still can't find a closed surface that has a net magnetic flux going through it. But hang on a sec, how is it that we were able to measure a non-zero magnetic flux through that rectangular loop next to the wire from before? The difference was that wasn't a closed surface, that was an open surface. A closed surface needs to have some clearly defined inside area and some clearly defined outside area. That one didn't have either. It turns out, no matter what closed surface we choose, we'll never find one with a net magnetic flux going through it, current or no current. Now, all this wasn't exactly a proof, but as far as we know, the net magnetic flux through any closed surface in space is always equal to zero. There's no net magnetic flux through any closed surface you could ever draw, and nobody has ever found a situation that would indicate otherwise. Another way of saying exactly the same thing is that magnetic field lines don't originate or terminate anywhere. They always form these curvy loops that go round and round. Before, when we were dealing with electric fields, the electric field lines originated at positive charges and terminated at negative charges. Simply drawing a surface around the positive charge, it's easy to see that we have a net electric flux since many field lines are leaving the surface and none are coming in and that's because all of them originate from the positive charge in this example. The magnetic field, on the other hand, never originates or terminates anywhere. All the B field does is form closed loops, so it's impossible to construct a closed surface which has more magnetic field lines leaving it than entering it. So we've settled on a strange equation. The closed surface integral of B dot dA is always equal to zero. This equation doesn't really have a name, so some just call it Gauss's law for magnetism. There was one other equation that looked structurally similar to Gauss's law. Do you remember what it was? Ampere's law. We mentioned that the closed loop integral of B dot dL sort of reminded us of the closed surface integral of E dot dA. 
So there's something strange going on here. We've got all these equations and they seem to be linked in some way, but we're not sure exactly how. And I'm just going to leave you hanging here. We only have some pieces of the puzzle at this point, so we'll collect the remaining pieces in the next few modules and link everything together near the end of electromagnetism. Trust me, you're going to like it.